Time and time again, at key moments in Israel's genocidal war against Gaza, Western politicians and media outriders have sought to put the focus of the world's attention not on Israel, but on the depravity or the supposed depravity of Palestinians. Now, when the war was first beginning, we were bombarded with lurid, now debunked claims of how Hamas tortured babies. And now, after the ICJ has found that Israel might plausibly be committing genocide, headlines have been dominated instead by UN agencies supposedly being filled with terrorists. But in between those two events, there was another key moment in the war. At the start of December, a week-long ceasefire between Hamas and Israel ended, and Israel once again began its deadly bombardment of Gaza. So the focus should really have been, you know, on what Israel were doing in Gaza. But around that time, with that renewed bombing, there was another deeply disturbing set of allegations being circulated, this time involving sexual violence. Hamas has committed sexual violence. They've committed rape. Um, we have no reason at all to doubt those reports. Um, uh, when you look at all the atrocities that Hamas uh, carried out on October 7th and the atrocities that they have carried uh, out since, the fact that they continue to hold women hostages, the fact that they continue to hold children hostages, the fact that it seems one of the reasons they don't want to turn women over that they've been holding hostage and the reason this pause fell apart is they don't want those women to be able to talk about what happened to them during their time in custody. Um, certainly, there is very uh, little that I would put beyond Hamas when it comes to its treatment of civilians and particularly its treatment uh, of women. CNN has, has led the coverage when it comes to the evidence uh, uh, mounting in Israel of uh, rapes and, and sex crimes committed by Hamas against mm -hmm. women and girls, maybe even against men. Uh, on October 7th. Why do you think the United Nations and the international community has been so slow to condemn these atrocities? I, I can't think of a, a real reason. Um, well, let me just put it this way. I've heard anti-Semitism hypothesized as a reason why the UN and the international community might be uh, so slow to acknowledge this. What do you think? The uh, sexual violence that uh, we saw on October 7th uh, is beyond anything that, uh, that I've seen either. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And look, I don't have a good answer to that question. I think it's a question that these organizations, these countries need to ask themselves. Hamas using rape, sexual violence, and terrorism and torture of Israeli women and girls is appalling and unforgivable. You should, when I was there, saw some of the photographs. And it's beyond, it's, it's beyond comprehension. We all have to condemn such brutality without equivocation, without exception. So as you heard there, these serious allegations about sexual violence also came with a critique of UN organizations who seemed, or purportedly, they suggested, were reluctant to determine whether mass rapes had taken place. Now, on this show, at the time, we did a detailed segment defending the UN, and we made two key points. First, while the allegations against Hamas fighters were appalling, the evidence about systematic sexual violence was fairly thin. And second, that Israel attacking groups like UN women was a bit rich, given they were refusing to let those same groups into Israel to investigate the claims Israel was making. So why won't you condemn these supposed crimes, or these alleged crimes, I should say, that you, even though we won't let you investigate them yourselves, right? It, it seemed to us to be somewhat, you know, th there were questions to be asked, right? And a number of other outlets made similar critiques concerning the quality of evidence deployed by Israel and their American backers. Right? After that, though, in late December, the New York Times came forward with a high-profile report which they claimed put to rest any skepticism about the extent of sexual violence used by Palestinian fighters on October the 7th. Now, the article was titled Screams Without Words, and it was by a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter, Jeffrey Gethelman, and it claimed to confirm that Hamas weaponized sexual violence on October the 7th. The NYT said their investigation uncovered new details showing a pattern of rape, mutilation, and extreme brutality against women in those attacks. Now, it's those words, weaponized and pattern, that are particularly important, because the article suggested that the sexual assaults alleged to have occurred on October the 7th weren't random, but rather they were part of a pattern. And that would suggest, you know, that, the much that there was a much larger undiscovered um, quantity of sexual violence. So they've sort of, they're just seeing the surface of this, this much deeper 
iceberg, this pattern um, of sexual assaults. Now, the article also said that sexual assaults were weaponized by Hamas. So in other words, Hamas used sexual violence in a deliberate and premeditated fashion as a weapon of war. That was the big claim being made. And as I say, this was all sort of as sort of the second round of the bombardment of Gaza was taking place. And that piece was widely shared at the time as incontrovertible proof that the claims being made by Israel and their allies were borne out in fact. A little bit later, just two weeks ago, The Guardian published a very similar piece. They said that evidence points to systematic use of rape and sexual violence by Hamas in the 7th of October attacks. Now, both of these reports were very influential, shared by lots and lots of people, as I say, as confirmation um, that all of these allegations made by the Americans and the Israelis had been true, essentially. But again, both of them appeared to contain significant problems. So the first problem was a claim the New York Times made about the family members of a purported victim of sexual violence. Now, the NYT story opened with the description of a viral video of a dead Israeli woman, clothing torn, her face burned. Her family later identified her as Gal Abdush, a working class woman who had disappeared from the Nova rave along with her husband, Nagi. Now, the New York Times reported this. Some members of the Abdush family saw that video and another version of it. They immediately suspected that the body was Miss Abdush, and based on the way her body was found, they feared that she might have been raped. Right. So again, you know, appalling. Um, you know, this person did die. It's, it's a tragedy and a crime, right? But it's important that we're very clear about what are the facts in this case because the family denied the specific claim there. Right. Two of Gal Abdush's sisters took to Instagram to dispute the New York Times claims about rape, with one suggesting the family had been manipulated. She wrote that the Times had only, quote, mentioned they want to write a report in memory of Gal, and that's it. If we knew that the title would be about rape and butchery, we'd never accept that. Other family members objected too. Now, Monda Weiss reported this. On December the 29th, the Israeli website Ynet published an interview with Eti Bracker, Gal Abdush's mother. In the interview, the mother says that the family knew nothing about the sexual assault issue until the piece in the Times was published. Quote, we didn't know about the rape at all. We only knew after a New York Times journalist contacted us. They said they matched evidence and concluded that she had been sexually assaulted. Unquote. Then on January the 1st, Nisim Abdush, Nagi's brother, appeared in an interview on Israeli Channel 13. During the 14-minute interview, Nisim repeatedly denied that his sister-in-law was raped. He explained that his brother Nagi had called him at seven in the morning saying his wife was killed and he was next to her body. Then he continued to communicate until 7.44 and never mentioned anything related to sexual assault. Nisim also stated that no official party informed them of these doubts or this investigation, neither the police nor forensic experts. In the interview, Abdush reiterated that his brother's wife was not raped and that the media invented it. Right? So you have a family here claiming they were manipulated by New York Times reporters and denying the article's central claim about sexual assault, right? So the article says, when the family saw this picture, they assumed sexual assault. The family have said, that did not happen, right? That is not true. There was also a second problem um, with the article. So the New York Times seemed a bit quick to make an inference from testimony that didn't necessarily justify the inferences they were making. So a former IDF Special Forces soldier told the paper um, that he had witnessed five men in civilian clothes rape and then murder a woman. So again, horrific allegation, be in no doubt absolutely horrific. The authors of the New York Times piece, um, though, used evidence like this to conclude that rape was used as a weapon of war by Hamas. So a very, very specific claim. But listen to what that witness, so he's called Raz Cohen, told CNN a week after the article was published. I know none of this is easy to talk about, but it's important that the world hear from witnesses. While you were hiding out that day, hiding from Hamas, uh, you saw five men, five of these terrorists, pulling a young woman out of a van. Tell, tell us what you saw next. I hide in the bush, and uh, 30 meters from the bush, I saw a, a white van that arrived uh, near the bush. And uh, from the van, uh, uh, five guys, five... Uh, uh, C civilians is from uh, Gaza, 
normal civilians, as not uh, soldiers uh, from Nukhba's uh, soldiers. It was uh, <clears throat> regular uh, people from Gaza with uh, normal clothes, and uh, they uh, started to pull their clothes off. Uh, it was it was like a half a circle and uh, the girl was in the middle of the circle and uh, after they pulled the clothes uh, off uh, of the girl uh, they started to one one of them started to to rape her so again really really horrible horrible allegations and it, you know it speaks to the intense suffering so many civilians were subject to on October the 7th we shouldn't deny that right it's absolutely true that lots of civilians suffered enormously right and i'm sure there were lots of you know women who who did suffer sexual violence and that's awful and of course that should be condemned but that particular interview does create a problem for the new york times because they explicitly said that hamas used rape as a weapon of war Right? And claims like those of Raz Cohen were used to justify the idea that sexual violence was part of Hamas's battle plan. So that was the key talking point. You know, These guys went into um, Gaza and it was a specific part of Hamas's battle plan that they would rape as many people as they could, essentially. Right, But that doesn't seem to back up that claim. And as I say, it was an important claim because this was used just as Israel was restarting its bombardment of, of Gaza to basically justify it. Of course, they have to keep bombing Hamas. They are so, you know, they are so depraved. They are not like any army that anyone has ever fought before. You know, these, these are the the definition of of pure evil. Um, now, Cohen, who you just saw in that interview, he would later refuse to be re-interviewed by the New York Times, um, saying he was quote working to recover from the trauma he suffered. Now, I can imagine that man, you know, has suffered um, a lot of trauma. Finally, there was a third problem involved in the New York Times simply not vetting its witnesses properly, right? So some of the most graphic and shocking testimony in the New York Times report um, comes from a 26-year-old woman called Sapir. She is described as one of the Israeli police's key witnesses. Um, but the New York Times corroborated her testimony with this. So they say, Yura Carroll, a 22-year-old security consultant, says he was hiding in the same spot and he can be seen in one of Sapir's photos. He and Sapir were part of a group of friends who had met up at the party. In an interview, Mr. Carroll said he barely lifted his head to look at the road, but he also described seeing a woman raped and killed. So you now have sort of two witnesses instead of one. That's very important when you're writing this kind of um, article for you know the paper record in the in the United States. But a simple check would have found that Carroll seemed to have told a very different story to the police. So in an article written six weeks earlier than the NYT piece, um, Israeli newspaper Haaretz said this about what a witness matching Carroll's description had told officials. Another witness who has recounted the incident to police was a man who was hiding behind the eyewitness and didn't see the rape. He said she told him at the time what she saw. So again, having someone who was there and was told at the time that is, you know, a significant witness or a significant, you know, person to to talk to about what happened was not quite what was written in the New York Times. Now, for its part, the Guardian article we showed you earlier, that simply just replicated much of the New York Times' somewhat sloppy reporting, right? So they, they sent it out as this push notification. They said, it's a really important piece of journalism, but it actually seems to have been lifted largely from other outlets. So on the left is the opening of an NBC News article published in early December. On the right is the Guardian investigation published six weeks later. As you can see, entire passages were copied word for word. Now, of course, all of this was taboo to raise at the time. Of course, this is a very sensitive subject, so it's understandable to some degree. But it now turns out that concerns about this reporting have actually been aired within the New York Times, right? And it's apparently caused a significant internal controversy. The Intercept reports that the New York Times pulled an episode of its high-profile podcast called the Daily, featuring the sexual violence story after an internal row broke out at the paper. In the article, Ryan Grimm and Daniel Bogoslaw write that the episode had been scheduled for January the 9th, but they describe the sequence of events like this. As criticism of Gettleman's story grew, both internally and externally, producers at The Daily shelved the original script and paused the episode, according to newsroom sources familiar with the process. A new script was drafted, one that offered major caveats, allowed for uncertainty, 
and asked open-ended questions that were absent from the original article, which presented its findings as definitive evidence of the systematic use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. That new draft remains the subject of significant controversy and has yet to be aired on the flagship podcast. The producers and the paper of record find themselves in a jam. Run a version that hews closely to the previously published story and risk republishing serious mistakes, or publish a heavily toned down version raising questions about whether the paper still stands by the original report. One Times editorial staffer told The Intercept this There seems to be no self awareness at the top. The story deserved more fact checking and much more reporting. All basic standards applied to countless other stories. You worry about talking about such sensitive topics like this, but I actually think it's sensitive topics like this where, to some degree, sort of ideological warfare is used. And I think we saw that, you know, because pressure is put on people, right? So pressure was put on the UN. Why aren't you recognizing and condemning the systematic use of of rape in this conflict? Is it because you hate women? Is it because you're anti-Semitic? And they're saying, well, show us the evidence, you know, we want to be able to do our investigation. No, why? Well, you wouldn't demand to do an investigation of anyone else. Well, they probably would, by the way. And so all of these aspersions are cast about sort of how they don't care about Jewish women. And to me, it seems that a similar thing might have happened at a number of newspapers, right? Where they were saying, why aren't you reporting on the mass rapes? Why aren't you reporting on the systematic use of, of rape? And then those newspapers feel like, oh, okay, we should publish on this by sort of the testimony from people within the New York Times. And I think we've shown the audience sort of some of the real problems with these pieces, you end up because, you know, it it seems to me the editor says, come up with a detailed story about the systematic use of rape as a weapon of war. And then you're kind of looking for evidence to back that up. And you end up sort of accepting evidence, which really is of of a much lower standard than you would sort of accept for a story, which, you know, the editor didn't feel some reason that they wanted specifically to publish it, or they didn't feel obliged to publish it. I mean, what, what do you think about this? It is a shocking not only negligence of journalistic ethics, but exploitation. Um, In a moment like this, when, you know, from the moment that the 7th of October happened, I think everyone knew that we were on the brink. We were going to be on the brink of a huge backlash and a huge war. In that moment, the kinds of reporting that you do requires a huge amount of rigor and sensitivity. And for me, it's not only the fact that you see a suspension of journalistic norms, for example, in not corroborating sources, in not, you know, um, interviewing a source multiple times to ensure that their, their story doesn't change. All of these kind of journalistic 101 processes not being followed at a time when what you're putting out there is, go- is, is going to have a real human cost, that on its own is incredibly is incredibly shocking and is a huge abdic- abdication of responsibility. For me, what I found to be something that I haven't even heard of happening in any other kind of case is the story where you have, you know, a family of a girl who was killed agreeing to a story on the premise that this story is going to be about, you know, their daughter or their their family member and essentially being coerced into consenting something that was going to frame what happened to their daughter or their their relative in completely different ways. I mean, imagine finding out that the story of your daughter's death has become a rape story when that story has been published. And I think for me, that really does speak to this idea of people were looking, these journalists were looking for a particular story and were willing to even betray their own sources and exploit their own sources in order to get that story. And for me, you have to, you can't help but think it was a choice to suspend journalistic norms in that moment. And you have to ask yourself why. And for me, this is not about asking, you know, for special treatment from the New York Times. What we're simply saying is journalists need to do their job do the job that they're trained to do. And the job that you're trained to do is to make sure that when you're going to put out incredibly, particularly very sensitive claims in an extremely sensitive moment, that you apply the normal levels of due diligence that you would apply to any, you know, 
I've had experience, I'm not an investigative journalist myself, but I've had experiences of seeing journalist friends of mine following a story. And then at some point they could be like 70% into that story and eventually getting to a point that like where they say, you know, I don't have enough witnesses or corroboration or means of corroboration of this story to actually go ahead and publish this story, even if they would feel that, you know, I put in all this work and I feel like there's something here, but it's simply not enough for me to be able to put pen to paper. Either I have to find more in order to fill those journalistic standards or I have to drop the story. And for me, it's it's particularly in the fact that you have those family members and those those relatives who spoke to the New York Times and seem to have come out to say that the story that they gave is not the one that was actually printed um, or that something was extrapolated from the things that they said to make a story that they never claimed. That, to me, is actually the clearest indication that a serious drop in norms um, happened. And for me, I have to ask the question, why in this situation were those norms dropped? I think in reference to that family, so I think they have since said that they don't want the discrepancies between what they thought the article would contain and what they, you know, what it did contain to sort of mean people say there was no sexual violence that happened on October the 7th. It seems very, very likely that sexual violence did happen on October the 7th, right? There is there is testimony, but there isn't, what there isn't is enough evidence for the strong claim that I feel The Guardian and The New York Times really wanted to make that it was systematic it was used as a weapon of war. And essentially, you know, the command came from the top of Hamas and that this was sort of, this is part of the nature, the inherent nature of, of Hamas is that they are a bunch of rapists, right? That was not borne out here. And I think, you know, whatever it is that the family think about this, the, the fact of the matter is, the New York Times said the family saw this video and believed this, believed that it meant that she'd been raped. And then the family said, no, we didn't, right? So whatever, the, however the family feel about this now, that's a factual error. That's a discrepancy that needs to be answered for.